Hello, my name is Michael Johnson. I would like to tell you about the efforts of the Flow Induced Noise Technical Group um, this year. Um, I um, have a relatively large group and I'd like to discuss three topics myself and then pass it on to uh, one of our colleagues, um, Adam Nichols, to cover a particular topic in more depth. Um, the mission of the Flow Induced uh, Noise Group of the Center for Acoustic Vibration is the understanding and control of acoustic noise and structural vibration induced by fluid flow. So in this little diagram I have below, we have the flow uh, such as a jet would radiate sound directly. Um, the flow could excite a structure without making it vibrate such as a ceiling fan radiates noise just from the fact that the fan blade is present and the flow is going over it or you can have something where uh, you, you, you induce vibration of the structure and it vibrates uh, directly as a as it's radiated sound. So as I mentioned we have a very large group of um, researchers in this particular area. Um, the ones I'm talking about here are from the Applied Research Lab and also from Aerospace Engineering and also there's one from uh, Mechanical Engineering as well. Um, you can see on the left their names and on the right uh, these are their areas of expertise according to to me and how I've kind of defined them. So they may or may not agree, but this is kind of how I've characterized their uh, their expertise. And there's they're fairly general topics, and of course they would know both the theory and the, the measurement uh, measurements or whatever their disciplines are. So if you see something here that uh, strikes your fancy, feel free to contact these particular researchers um, to to see what's what's going on. So, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be talking about um, three research topics and I'll be passing it on to Adam. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, an empirically driven axisymmetric turbulence models for, for a pipe. I and mean, we're going to use um, a symmetry based approach. So faculty members here are um, Zachary Berger at the Applied Research Lab, Ryan Murray which uh, used to be a postdoc here at Penn State but now he's a He's an assistant professor at NC State and he's in the math department and then myself and then another researcher um, Amanda Hanford at the Applied Research Lab. So we're advising a master's and hope to be a PhD student uh, Jeremy Panabaker in the aerospace engineering department. So the goals of this project are to develop a simplified turbulence model for two-point correlations. Two-point correlations are important in terms of um, the correlation between two points is needed to characterize the forcing function and how it affects length scales on uh, on on sound. So we need to relationship determine the relationship between the velocities at various points in the flow field, and um, we're going to start with a relatively simple, fully developed pipe flow in the axial direction. Uh, that would, would allow the flow to go through and if you recall from your undergraduate studies in pipe flow um, when it's fully developed that the flow doesn't change much axially and uh, we wind up with a core region in the middle of the pipe and then toward the end is where we have these boundary layers that, that are in this. So we're interested in the core region of the pipe and we're doing that well. And we're going to use um, Lee theory was developed around 1900 uh, to develop um, uh, some symmetries based on um, group theory and there's other you know mathematics that are involved with that particular case. So we're exploiting some of this symmetry um, analysis that was uh, been developed in mathematics over the years to see if we can use that to examine cylindrical um, uh, coordinate systems um, of such a thing as a pipe flow in terms and we're trying to um, use experimental data to fill in some of the correlation models that uh, are fairly fundamental in, in characterizing what's going on with the turbulence. 
So um, as far as the experimental methodology is concerned, we're using a, a pipe flow that's fully developed and the fluid is glycerin. Uh, ARL for several years has had this tunnel and it's it's very well characterized and it's uh, it's it's a well behaved flow. So we're using particle image velocimetry collected in the glycerin tunnel and it's a higher viscosity so the scales of the turbulence are amplified and we'll be able to get uh, uh, very very detailed data wherever we need. And um, the data uh, we're, we're trying to do uh, the scaling laws with falsy profiles to match the theoretical equations. Um, in this particular case, we're looking first at the mean flow. We've got to start somewhere. So this is the mean flow. You can see the scale is kind of blown up, and the data is very smooth, taking the data with the particle image velocimetry. And you can see that we, we have a, a maximum velocity of non-dimensionally of one at the center, and then we uh, go, and then it drops off slightly uh, as we go out to about 35% of the radius out from the center line. So this is the uh, area of the flow that we're interested. Right now we're applying the, the mean flow. We'll be looking at the turbulence and we'll be doing curve fits to this data and be able to do some stuff with it. So um, the applications of this stuff would be, of course, flow through pipes and any kind of canonical symmetric flows like jets and wakes, etc., that that we could have um, for, for a flow field. The next topic I want to talk about is the control of a quadcopter propeller noise. As you're aware, there's lots of um, quadcopters and they, they're called drones for a reason. They, they make some sound that is sometimes unwanted and uh, there are cases where you want to minimize that noise so for surveillance or not bothering people too much for doing that. So the researchers here are Timothy Brungard and Stephen Olson at the Applied Research Laboratory. So um, last year I showed some of these results and we found that making the um, propeller bigger in diameter and um, uh, making it spin slower has a significant impact on reducing the amount of radiated sound that was made. So um, Dr. Brungard um, and wanted to investigate if there's any other ways of being able to reduce the sound without making the impeller or the rotors bigger in diameter and running at its own RPM. So one other thing he looked at, so if we had the same um, propeller but made the um, uh, weight of the whole vehicle less, how big an impact, how big is just the weight of being able to hover and if you cut the weight and you just reduce the amount of thrust, how much did that help the noise? So that's one thing. And then he also looked at, well, if, let's say if we can increase or decrease the number of blades or change the pitch of the, of the, um, of the, the rotor blades, how does that affect the noise and can we get some benefit from doing that? So you can see how a manufacturer would, would not, maybe not want to have a much bigger uh, rotor on there, but might want to consider these other design effects that may be easier to implement. So he looked at that. So, um, so how does weight drive the uh, propeller noise levels? So um, for a given propeller in a hover position, the weight is equal to static thrust and is relative to the tip of speed as, uh, as, you, as you know, as you, as the RPM squared and the diameter, you find out that the static thrust goes as the tip, um, tip squared and diameter squared. And we also know from the fact that the velocity um, affects the radiated sound um, by either velocity to the fifth or sixth power. So when you do these relationships, you find out that the velocity at the tip uh, is, is goes to the square root of the weight. And then we can see that uh, when, you, when you put in for the radiated sound power, you see that the radiated sound power as goes up as, as, as the cube of the weight. So we wanted to see how is that demonstrated or not. So in this particular case, we set up um, a case where we were able to measure the thrust as shown over on the left um, with a with a, uh, a balance and, and weights. And on the right, we're able to have a different configuration where we have a propeller and be able to measure the sound with microphones and be able to characterize uh, some directivity of the sound and be able to, to get some idea how much radiated sound it makes. So here's the result of 
top curve we have uh, uh, 27.8 newtons of force and then the RPM had to speed up in order to handle that and we wound up with uh, 84.6 dBA for that and then we also uh, had a case where uh, we reduced the load down to 13.9 newtons and in order to do that we were able to reduce the RPM and get the lowest level the DBA down to 72.6 so Tim was nice enough to provide some some uh, cases where you could you can actually click on hear the sound so let's hear the sound a little bit for each of these um, so here's the noise with the heavier wind And and here's the case for the lighter one. And you can see, so the fact that the weight less, you can see the reduction plus it's less irritating because the frequencies get shifted away from the, the 1000 hertz and you don't have as much noise in, in being so annoying to you. So uh, in summary, uh, we found that uh, reducing the weight made a significant difference in uh, the amount of noise because you were able to bring the RPM, uh, you know, the RPM didn't have to go up so much in order to keep the, to keep the weight. Now we looked at changing the number of the pitch and the blade numbers, but we found that that didn't really make much of a difference to the, to the radiated sound in this, in this particular case. So um, that worked out uh, to be pretty good. Um, uh, for at least reducing the weight, but these other design changes uh, were were of, of minor minor effect. Okay, so the, the final topic I'm going to cover is um, the design, control, and acoustics of a marine hydrokinetic cyclo turbine vehicle. So this is like the quadcopter, except for it's underwater, and it's a little bit it's a crossflow turbine rather than an axial um, um, axial um, uh, propeller. So um, the faculty members were myself and Joe Horn, and uh, the student that uh, Margaret Lee Goldschmidt did the work, and she uh, recently defended her thesis um, in, in early um, uh, October. So uh, I'll get into what the vehicle looks like, but the idea here is there may be cases where you want to uh, deploy a a turbine system that generates power so 90 percent of its time would be generating power and it would move different places so the idea would be to come up with a control system and to to be able to do that so uh, she developed a uh, system of uh, nonlinear control to um, do a dive and then do some turns and maneuvers to make the, the system do do what it's supposed to do. So this is all done theoretically to do, you know, a dive, a hover, a yaw, and a rise. And so that's kind of the scenario here. So uh, it would be deployed. Uh, you'd have some ship on board above that would have an umbilical and you'd move to the different locations and uh, you'd be able to um, um, you know, but thing, and then the, when when it's finally deployed, you, the umbilical will be put on shore, and it'll be generating power a, as you needed it. So um, the idea here to extend the noise would is there because we have four um, turbines. Is there a way to adjust the sound to cut down on one or perhaps two times um, blade passing frequency? Because these things do, because of their their nature, they generate a lot of. Uh, unsteady forces as they rotate around because it, it tends to chop the flow and makes that thing. So we were interested in coming up with a way of uh, phasing these particular blades um, with relative to each other and what we call clocking. So we would uh, adjust the phase between, uh, in this particular case, the left turbines would be in phase and the right turbines would be out of phase. So measurements were done in a uh, reverberant uh, tank where we had forces and we know there's a relationship between the forces that are measured in, in this in this um, uh, strain gauge uh, system and be able to generate um, some idea of what the steady and unsteady forces are for the system. So sort of the bottom line of all this was um, we were able to show um, that the um, 
that we were getting a reduction um, when we did the clocking the proper way. So the way the system was um, tested was we we wanted to have a slight difference between the RPMs of the turbines. And on the top figure, top left figure, we show the turbines are out of phase. Um, are, are slightly out of uh, RPM or a little bit different between the two. So as as time goes on, they're in phase and are out of phase and they're in phase. And that is re reflected by the solid curve on the right. So we can see there is a cancellation and there's an addition and so forth that goes on here. And our theory showed that uh, we should get about a 6.4 dB reduction, whereas um, we did uh, get a little bit better than that. And then on the bottom left curve, we show that the two uh, turbines um, uh, were, were also out of um, slightly different RPM from each other. And we see the undulation, but they're, they're, they were closer together in the same RPM. And then but we see that just because of the nature of how far they were apart, we see that we were only expecting a 4.6 dB. And that's kind of what we're seeing in the thing on his. So on the left, these curves, you can see the, the bigger circles are the kind of the dipole intensity. And we expect that it turned out just from the flow that we were doing in the tank, the one on the on the, the the on the right on the figure here is has a higher force than the other so we had to count for that effect as well okay so the final topic and i'll be handing off is um, a reduced order investigation of volumetric piv for noise coil controllation so this is uh, adam nichols will be presenting and then jeff harris and ted backwell were uh, collaborators thank you